this thing. Um, so I haven't posted the first video from yesterday. Yesterday's first video, the camera was pointed at the wrong thing. So I was dependent upon the screen capture, which worked marginally, meaning it didn't have any sound. So I had to pull the sound off of one video, put it on top of another video, and that took a good deal of the day. Um, it should be posted by this evening. What you'll see with the quality of the video is this video, which is a screen capture video, which was supposed to be better, is actually significantly worse than the actual camera videos. <laughs> now, there. Uh, but anyway, at least it has sound and it has video uh, together, and so that'll be posted later this evening, and I should have these guys up here posted this evening as well. So, um, why am I not having control? Okay, there we go. There we go. All right. Um, I posted on the uh, web page just a little bit, uh, just a few minutes ago, the... Um, a practice exam, and uh, I talked to Anna, and she's going to go through some of these um, questions that are on there uh, either uh, tomorrow or Tuesday. I will caution people very much. There's the practice exam information right there. Don't use the practice exam as a study guide. It's just not a good idea, okay? Use it as a way of understanding the format of the questions that I ask and use it for that purpose only. Uh, there are things I talk about I change from term to term, and so you're seeing a practice exam from a previous term. Some things I haven't even talked about this term. So if you waste time on that, then you're not going to be effectively studying. So you should be studying according to the things that I've talked about uh, in the class. The format of the exam that you will have is exactly the format that's on here. So I post it so that you have an understanding about what that format uh, actually is. The format of the exam will include a short answer section, a problem solving section and a longer answer section. That's the three things that you'll see on that exam. And I'll say more about that as we get closer uh, to that exam. Okay. Um, that's not centered very well on the screen, is it? Not one thing, it's another, isn't it? Okay. Uh, that's actually a projector problem. So what I want to do uh, today is finish up talking about protein structure, and then I'm going to uh, say the first uh, of a couple of lectures regarding protein characterization and uh, purification. And that's something that will be important for us to understand if we're going to, going to understand overall uh, protein function. So uh, that's the plan for today and tomorrow. Tomorrow I will finish talking about protein characterization and give what is usually the most popular lecture I give the entire term, and that is the lecture on hemoglobin. And so hemoglobin is um, a, a, where all of these things come together with respect to your understanding of protein structure and function. Hopefully, uh, you will enjoy uh, that lecture. Well, so what I want to do here is uh, go through and talk a little bit about what the, t the topic that I started talking about yesterday, which was, which was, um, there's my question. Quaternary structure. So I said there's four levels of structure that a, a protein has. Not all proteins have quaternary structure. Not all proteins have um, tertiary structure. We saw examples yesterday of fibrous proteins that have only uh, primary and secondary. All proteins have primary structure because without primary structure, they wouldn't be a protein. All right. They all have pri primary. They all have secondary. Unless they've been denatured, they all have secondary structure. If they've got turns and things that give them a three-dimensionality to them instead of just a two-dimensionality of the uh, secondary structure, then they have tertiary structure. Tertiary structure proteins we frequently refer to as globular. And I can't think of a better explanation for them than to say that you saw them laying on a table. If you saw them there, they would look like a glob. That's just exactly what they look like. Okay? So globular structures are that way. Now we're talking about quaternary structure, and quaternary structure is something that not all proteins have. What does a protein have to have to have quaternary structure? It has to have at least two polypeptide subunits. So we saw yesterday that insulin had two polypeptide subunits and they were joined together by disulfide bonds. What you see on the screen is a 
polypeptide, or uh, I'm sorry, a protein that has two polypeptide chains. This is an example we call a dimer. Okay, so when we look at this structure, we see that we've got a red guy here that uh, is identical in structure to the yellow one over here. Many, many proteins in nature exhibit this property. Two identical subunits. Some have four identical subunits. Some have two identical of one type and two identical of another type. Hemoglobin's an example of that. Some have 12 subunits and all kinds of mixes. If they have more than one subunit, it will have quaternary structure. There's no ifs, ands, ors, or buts to that. So quaternary structure is important to understand, and it's probably, yes, ma'am? Sorry, just to clarify, so sure. the subunits don't have to be identical as long as it has They do not have to be identical subunits. That's correct. But as long as it has more than one subunit, it will, by definition, have quaternary structure, because that's what quaternary structure is all about. Okay? All right. So um, hemoglobin, as I said, is a, is a prime example of one that has quaternary structure. Hemoglobin has two <coughs> identical subunits called alpha, and it has two other identical subunits called beta. And they're color-coded here. Um, I'm not sure which one's which, but we have two identical in yellow, two identical in red. And the alphas and the betas themselves are very, very similar in overall structure. You would have a hard time looking at one of these and telling if you have alpha or beta subunits. Okay? Now, hemoglobin, uh, when, when, when proteins have quaternary structure, we see that in some cases they have some interesting and different properties than proteins that don't have quaternary structure. What does that mean? Well, it's more than just a structural difference. There are characteristics and there are properties that these proteins have that vary. So I'll give you a very brief example and I'll say more about this when I talk about hemoglobin. But myoglobin I talked about yesterday is related to hemoglobin. Myoglobin has one subunit and that one subunit that it has is very similar to one of the four subunits that hemoglobin has. But because myoglobin only has one subunit, it doesn't have quaternary structure. When proteins have quaternary structure, the individual subunits have the opportunity to interact with each other. And those interactions give rise to properties that the protein that has that quaternary structure exhibits. In the case of hemoglobin, as we will see, the individual subunits actually communicate with each other. They actually communicate with each other. And because they communicate with each other, hemoglobin has very different properties with respect to binding oxygen than myoglobin has. I talked yesterday about how myoglobin is a storage protein for oxygen. We find it in muscles. Myoglobin is not very good for delivering oxygen. Okay? It's not very good for delivering oxygen. It's very good for grabbing a hold of oxygen, but when it gets to the target cells, it doesn't want to give it up. If you ever had an older sibling and the older sibling had a toy that they wanted and your mom says, go give it out and give the toy to so-and-so, they take the toy out very nicely, but they don't want to give it to you because it's my toy. Myoglobin exhibits that property with oxygen. Hemoglobin is a great sharer. It has the ability to grab oxygen where it's needed, and it has the ability to give up oxygen where it's also needed. We'll see that that arises from the fact that, that hemoglobin has quaternary structure. Okay. This is a, the protein coat of a virus. Rhinoviruses cause cold-like symptoms in us. And you can see it's a real good example. This is quite a complex of proteins that have come together to make this protein coat. There's a lot of interactions between a lot of different subunits, many of which are identical. The identical ones have the same color as we can see on here, that come together to give an overall shape and give an overall structure uh, to this protein. This is an example. This is a virus that you see the, uh, depicted on the screen. And it's an example of a self-assembling structure. These things came together. And when we think about assembling, we think, ah, quaternary structure, because we've got subunits interacting with each other. And that's exactly what we see on this uh, screen here. Now, um, we think about, well, why do proteins associate with each other? And not surprisingly, what you find with respect to proteins 
is, uh, in the quaternary structure, is that they have the same forces that stabilize quaternary structure that were involved in stabilizing tertiary structure. We see hydrogen bonds, we see disulfide bonds, we see hydrophobic interactions, we see ionic bonds, we see metallic bonds, we see all of these, all of the forces that were involved in stabilizing tertiary structure can also be involved in stabilizing quaternary structure. Okay, so very, very important considerations in terms of stabilization. That's not surprising. That's the chemistry that's built into the molecules that make up proteins, excuse me, make up proteins and make up the subunits uh, comprising multi-subunit proteins. So a pretty cool example of stuff there. Okay. Now, um, I've made a big deal, and so we've gone now through the four different levels of protein structure, and uh, at some level that becomes sort of a memorization thing, and I like to have things for you be um, a little more meaningful in, in, in the terms of real world sorts of things. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about some real world proteins and how some of these forces that we see involved here play very, very important roles, both in the properties of the proteins and in the uh, impacts that they have on life and health. So uh, the first one of these I want to talk about is a very interesting and odd enzyme. This is called bi uh, bovine ribonuclease. And a ribonuclease is an enzyme. Whenever you see a term in this class uh, ending in ASE, it is an enzyme. So ribonuclease ends in ASE. It is an enzyme. And enzymes, of course, are proteins that catalyze reactions. This enzyme catalyzes a reaction that's a very, very abundant reaction we have in our cells, in virtually every cell on Earth. They have this type of, of enzymatic activity. This guy will break down RNA. Okay? It's very, very good at breaking down RNA. Now, there are some reasons why cells want to break down RNA. There's some very important reasons. I won't talk about them this term. Dr. Merrill will talk about them next term. But suffice it to say that cells need to break down RNA and break it down effectively and rapidly. So cells are loaded with RNases. They're so loaded with RNases that they ooze out of cells. Okay? If you were to take like the sweat I have on my hands right now and take even the tiniest droplet of that, it would be loaded with RNases. Okay? If you work in a lab where you are studying RNA, you find that those RNases are a curse because they're really, really everywhere. If you touch something with your hand, you've just contaminated it with RNAs. Now, for most enzymes, that's not a problem because most enzymes we can take and we can destroy their activity fairly simply. We denature them. And we denature them in very easy ways. For example, we can denature them by heating them up and boiling them. Our cells have enzymes called DNases. With DNases, we can, in fact, destroy their activity very easily by simply, boil, by simply boiling them with glassware. We can put DNA in that glassware that we're, that we're using. It'll sit there forever. No problem as long as we don't contaminate it with something else. If we take that same glassware and we boil it, we put it in a steam autoclave, and we autoclave that, and we put RNA in there, the RNA will very quickly be destroyed. That tells us something important. It tells us that the RNases that were there were not destroyed by that autoclave, and those enzymes are stable to temperature. Very, very stable to temperature. In fact, if you want to destroy RNases by temperature, you basically have to bake them. Labs that do a lot of RNA work bake their glassware at like 500 degrees Fahrenheit because that's about the only way they can kill those enzymes. Now we think RNases, that's interesting. So most proteins are not that way. Most proteins fall apart when we do that treatment. I've talked about one force in this class that was the strongest one that I said was very important for stabilizing tertiary structure of proteins. What was it? Disulfide bonds, covalent bonds of disulfides. Many proteins have disulfide bonds. Most proteins, in fact, have disulfide bonds. 
But the disulfide bonds that are contained in ribonuclease are strategically placed to where they actually give great structural integrity to the, to the protein. So that even though we may disrupt all the hydrogen bonds as a result of boiling, the placement of these disulfide bonds that we have within ribonuclease allows, when we lower the temperature back down, allows the hydrogen bonds to form and the overall original shape to come back. Most proteins don't have that. Even though they have disulfide bonds, they're not strategically placed. And so once I disrupt the structure, it's kind of like I can't put the pieces back together. Ribonuclease has the ability to do that. Now that's a very interesting and unusual property. There are a few enzymes that have this property. Ribonuclease is one of them. If we look at this, it's not a complicated structure, okay? Ribonuclease has a total of 124 amino acids, number one right here being the amino end, the carboxyl end over here, 124, and in between there, there are one, two, three, four disulfide bonds, okay? Those four disulfide bonds allow that protein to go through all kinds of gyrations and uh, come back to its original shape when we cool it back down. Now, this gives us a little bit of a thought exercise with respect to protein shape, with respect to protein sequence and so forth, and so I want to lead you through this just a little bit to tell you uh, more about that. Okay, so um, I mentioned yesterday that disulfide bonds can be broken by various chemical reagents. One of the chemical reagents we can use to break down disulfide bonds is a compound that I described as mercaptoethanol. What you see on the screen is the structure of mercaptoethanol right here. Mercaptoethanol looks like this guy. No, you don't need to know the structure. But you can see mercaptoethanol has a sulfhydryl group. That means it still has its electrons and protons that the disulfide bond had lost. Mercaptoethanol is capable of donating its protons and electrons to the disulfide bond to reduce the disulfide bond and to itself become oxidized to its, a disulfide bond of its own. So basically we've swapped electrons and protons. Electrons and protons have gone here to make this and as a consequence this guy lost its electrons and protons and became a disulfide bond. Chemically we can do this very easily without harm. Now, if I took strand egg hall and I took one of its major support beams out, we would imagine that the building might still stand, but the building would probably not be as stable as it was before, right? The same thing happens if I reduce the disulfide bonds that are providing structural integrity to a protein. If I break that those structural bonds that are giving that protein stability, I might change the property of the protein. Everybody with me? You can see where this is headed, I think. Okay. So, um, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Now, there's various ways I can break the hydrogen bonds in a protein. And your, your, uh, the, what you see on the screen are things besides, uh, things besides uh, heat that can do that. Structure disruptors. Urea is one of them. Urea has a very good ability to break hydrogen bonds. It means I can disrupt secondary structure without heating a protein up. Makes it simpler. Another the one that will do the same thing is guanidinium chloride. Simple compound, it will disrupt hydrogen bonds. So either of these chemicals will have the same effect on a protein as heat does. Now, mercaptoethanol doesn't disrupt secondary structure, it disrupts disulfide bonds, but used in conjunction with these two, we can actually have an effect on the structure of ribonuclease, okay? Now, if I take and I take ribonuclease and I treat it with mercaptoethanol and I treat it with a very high concentration of urea, I can actually unfold that protein. The unfolding happens, as you can see here, a nice organized structure on the left, 
moving over to a more highly disorganized structure on the right. The secondary structure is disrupted, and because those structural bonds aren't holding everything together, the tertiary structure as well is destroyed. You might think, and you would be correct, that if I took this guy right here on the right and I treated it with RNA, would I see any RNA being destroyed? If I did this properly, in fact, I would see no RNA being destroyed. The enzyme is dead. Okay? Now, RNA teaches us something else about protein structure that is even more interesting. I've got my mixture here of my denatured protein. I've got urea there, and I've got mercaptoethanol in there. Let's imagine, first of all, I get rid of the mercaptoethanol. I can use a chemical to treat it and get rid of the mercaptoethanol. Okay? Let's imagine further that I start slowly taking away the urea. Here it's 8 molar. That's very concentrated urea. But I can reduce the concentration of urea in that solution. And as I reduce the concentration of the urea in that solution, I discover something really cool. The RNA activity starts to come back. Now, most proteins, when you denature them, they stay denatured. They don't come back. That's good because we wash our hands to kill bacteria by killing the proteins in there. We cook our food to destroy the proteins, to destroy the bacteria in there. If we cooked our food and we then put it out at room temperature where we ate it and those proteins came back, we would regenerate life, right? The old Frankenstein movie. That doesn't happen. <coughs> most proteins don't do that, but ribonuclease is not like most proteins. It starts to come back. Now, interestingly, the fact that it comes back tells us something. The fact that we get that structure back tells us a very, very important lesson that you actually learned yesterday. And I'd like to ask you what you think that lesson is. What does the re return of that structure tell us about proteins? The what? It tells us exactly that. It tells us the importance of primary structure. And what is the importance of primary structure? The folding, yeah. exactly. Okay. So what, she, what, what Sarah said is exactly right, that the, the sequence of amino acids is really all that is necessary for folding to occur. Now, once something gets misfolded, it may be hard to fold it right back, but ribonuclease doesn't have that problem. Most proteins have that problem. Ribonuclease does not have that problem. It starts coming back. That is really cool. It tells us, again, the importance of that primary structure. Every property that the protein has, structure, also enzymatic function, those arise simply from the primary structure. Now, that's relatively easy to understand. Now I'm going to tell you something that may be less easy to understand. First of all, when this guy comes back, I don't get as much activity as I had when I started. I can get rid, eventually, of all the urea and let's say I had 1,000 units of activity before I started, and I denature, and when I come back, what I discover is I might have 50 or 100 units of activity. I don't get 100% activity. Now, I'd like you to think about that for a second, and then I'll tell you something that'll surprise you. If I allow it to come back, and I put just a tiny trace of mercaptoethanol in there, I may get 150 or 200 units of activity. Mercaptoethanol is actually giving me more units of activity than no mercaptoethanol at all. Yet mercaptoethanol played a role in denaturing this protein. What in the world is going on? I think you have an idea. So I guess when you took it all out in the first place, a bunch of them folded up wrong, made the wrong bisulfide bonds. Yep. And when you added more ethanol, it took that apart, and then they naturally reformed to the functional enzyme. You are exactly right. Okay. Cool. That's rare that, that, that somebody comes up with that. So the ethanol, what happens is when this guy comes back together, keep in mind that we have individual protein molecules 
that are floating around the solution. And they bump into each other. When they bump into each other, let's imagine that this disulfide bond over here bumps into a disulfide bond in a different protein before it has a chance to bump into the right one within itself. Well, once it's made a disulfide bond with a different protein, it's hosed. It's not going to fold properly. It's not going to regenerate activity because that disulfide bond right here had to bond, for example, to this one over here. But if it's bound to another protein, that can't happen. So we get a small percentage back originally because we have some accidental collisions that don't give rise to properly folded proteins. However, if we add mercaptoethanol a tiny amount during that process, the mercaptoethanol can break some of those bonds and allow the protein to find the things that it's after. Now what we saw when we added mercaptoethanol before was we didn't lose activity. We didn't lose activity until we added urea. So mercaptoethanol by itself doesn't destroy the tertiary structure. It destroys the disulfide bonds. It's destroying some disulfide bonds that are not productive. Does that make sense to everybody? Very, very good answer. Yes, sir? It seems like it would randomly do this, so why won't it break bonds and then in improperly bond? Them? Like, wouldn't that reduce function? Say it again now. So if you're breaking them and then they're coming back together properly, what's, what's stopping them from breaking proper bonds and then reforming What's stopping them from breaking proper bonds and causing a problem? As I noted before, we may destroy the, the strength of the structure, but we don't destroy the structure. So even though I may destroy a, a, the disulfide bond over here between a proper one between 110 and 58, if the thing has folded properly, it still stays in that structure. It's just weakened. Oh, okay. You see? So it's a win-win. It's a real odd situation where the longer you would let this go, the more properly folded enzyme you would get. Other questions? Kind of cool stuff. OK, so ribonuclease teaches us a very important lesson. Like I said, that's a lesson that uh, is one that is an unusual one. We don't see this happen with very many enzymes. But thanks to ribonuclease, we can understand uh, this. Oh. OK, um, so this is showing uh, the, the, that we have some improper, uh, well, actually, this is showing the sort of steps in the process uh, that can happen. So here's an improper bond here. It turns out that folding turns out to occur, occur, as best we can tell, in a sort of a sequential process. There's an ordered series of events that, that result in a properly folded protein. And to be honest, we know very, very little about the folding process. It's a tremendously researched area of science, but we know very, very little about it. What we would like to be able to do would be to take the amino acid sequence of a protein that we Isolate, that we determine from the genome. We can sequence the genome and we can say, okay, here's a protein. It's got uh, methionine, alanine, glycine, lysine. We have this sequence. We would like to know the structure of this protein. We can't do that today. In fact, there's a good likelihood we will never be able to do it exactly correctly. Okay? There's, and I can say that with some reasonable assurance. And let me show you why. There's a phenomenon known as Leventhal's paradox. And I don't think I've got it here, um, at least not named as such. But let me describe to you what Leventhal's paradox is. Leventhal, sure, L-E-V-I-N-T-H-A-L. Leventhal's paradox teaches us something surprising about protein structure. So I just told you folding is probably a sequential process. Maybe I have a, one disulfide bond forms before another one does. I have a certain secondary structure that forms first and then, you know, and so forth. So we can imagine there's a series of events that happen. Protein folding is so enormously complex that Leventhal's paradox gives you a handle for this, all right? Let's imagine I have a simple protein, 50 amino acids long. That's very small. That's very simple. What if I took... And I looked at all the different possible angles within a certain realm uh, of possibilities that could exist between all the different single bonds in that protein. And I started 
saying, well, if protein folding is a random process, I should be able to sort it out using a computer going through a random process and be able to predict the structure of that protein. When people first started studying protein structure with computers, they said, ah, oh, the computer will be able to do this. This is not a problem. Because the computer can do things billions of times per second. So all we have to do is have a powerful enough computer and go through that random process, and we'll be able to eventually figure out the structure of any and every protein. Leventhal's paradox says that's not possible. With Leventhal's paradox, Leventhal sat down and calculated if folding was a random process, okay, then we went through all these different possible angles, all these possible interactions, how long would it take the most powerful computer on the face of the earth to come up with that random structure? The final structure that ran, determined by a random basis. How long do you suppose it would take? Be brave, somebody. A year? Okay, longer. Seven years, longer. 500 years, longer. Now, I'm going to tell you the magnitude of this. If you took every computer on the face of the earth and made them as powerful as the most powerful supercomputer on the face of the earth, and you let them all work on this problem, it would take a million times longer than the age of the universe to solve the problem by a random basis. Whoa. We're not going to solve it on a random basis. But that tells us something important. It tells us that protein folding is not driven by a random basis. We may not understand those steps in that process, but they are not fully random. There may be a randomness to it, but they are not 100% random. They lead a protein down a path that results in folding. And folding, by the way, can happen in anywhere from seconds to minutes. It happens extraordinarily fast, given the complexity of the process that we're talking about. Okay? Now, folding is an important phenomenon, because if proteins don't fold properly, we have major problems that can arise. Everybody has heard, for example, of mad cow disease. Mad cow disease arises from improper folding of a very important protein in the brain. That protein is found in the brain of virtually every animal on the face of the earth. In fact, there are progenitors of that protein that are found in yeast. Do humans get mad cow disease? Well, they get the human equivalent of it, which is called Jacob Kreutzfeld syndrome. It works very much like mad cow disease. People lose their minds and death ensues within a short period of time. It is an extraordinarily odd disease. It is infectious, okay? Not overly infectious, fortunately, but it is infectious. It can be transmitted from one organism to another organism. But it is not, it is the only class of diseases on the face of the earth, but it is not linked to a nucleic acid. When we think of a virus, a virus injects its DNA or it injects its RNA into an organism and that disease arises from the genetic information that's been transferred. Mad cow disease arises from a misfolded protein that gets transmitted. Folding is important. Now, this is going to surprise you. How does a misfolded protein cause a disease? Because if I transfer this protein over to my cells, I won't have this protein, right? Yes, I will. This protein is encoded, as I said, in the genome of virtually every animal on the face of the earth. Okay? You have this protein in your brain, but this protein is folded just fine. If it were not, you wouldn't be sitting here. You would have Creutzfeldt-Jakob syndrome. You would have mad cow. Okay? What happens in the infection of this disease is that a single, a single misfolded protein can bind to properly folded proteins and induce misfolding. Ooh, nasty stuff. Very nasty stuff. Protein folding is important. Now, here a protein is affecting other proteins. I'm going to come back and talk about that in a second. But there's something even worse 
about mad cow disease that scares people, okay? And what scares people about mad cow disease is that this is an example of another protein that when it's misfolded is extraordinarily stable. You've heard this with ribonuclease. You're going to begin to think all proteins are this way, and they're not. But this misfolded protein, by the way, prion is the name that we give uh, to this uh, family of proteins in, the, in, the, in this disease. Okay? Here's properly folded proteins. Here are misfolded proteins. Here is what happens when everybody gets together. They form what are called amyloid plaques. The brain basically becomes loaded with these proteins. The neurological function is lost. And the animal or person having it loses their mind, literally. Yes? The product, I would call that a misfolded protein. So these, oh, I'm sorry, these, are, these form what are called amyloid plaques. That's not the name for these, but, but the, the structures, the macroscopic structures that they form are called, macro, are, are called amyloid plaques. Okay? Now, these destroy nerve cells. That's why the, the organisms that have them lose their mind. Cows go mad. Sheep that get it get a disease called scrapie. And when they get scrapey, they, they call it scrapey because they literally scratch themselves to death uh, because they're trying to scratch something off of themselves. Humans, as they say, lose their minds and, and don't last very long. Uh, the scary thing about this guy right here, this misfolded protein, okay, is that it's extraordinarily stable. Cooking does not destroy its function. Now, when we think about, for example, I don't want to have E. coli, so I cook my hamburger well. I don't want to have food poisoning, so I cook whatever it is I've got there and I keep it refrigerated so that it doesn't come together. Misfolded proteins are destroyed by heating them to 700 degrees Fahrenheit. Most people don't cook their food at that. Now, that's the scary side. We don't know how these misfolded proteins are transmitted. It's probably not casual. We know they're not overly infectious. But we, uh, and we don't know, for example, if you can acquire them in the diet. That's not known. There are some suggestions from uh, evidence in uh, England that that may happen to a limited extent, that it can be acquired in the diet. Okay? But the problem is that the protein ultimately has to make its way to the brain. And how it does that through the diet is, not, is, is open to anybody's guess. So that's, that's not completely clear. Okay? So it may not be as scary as all that. But nonetheless, it's something to, uh, that's a matter of concern. Questions about that? Yeah? Is the, <coughs> is the all improperly folded protein are very stable? I didn't say all. No. So this improperly folded protein is very stable. Not all misfolded proteins are very stable. You probably have misfolded proteins in your body. I don't want to give you the impression that any misfolded protein causes a problem. In fact, I'm going to show you um, uh, how we deal with misfolded proteins in a second. Okay? It may even play a role in this. We don't know that. Okay? But misfolding is, is a phenomenon that does occur. Unfolding is a phenomenon that does occur. And so we fortunately have ways of dealing with a lot of misfolding. Okay, so I want to show you that in just a second. Other questions about this? Yeah. So this one takes 700 degrees Fahrenheit to get killed. Okay. Most misfolded proteins, like most proteins, don't require that. Okay. okay, this one does. This one does. That's not clear. Uh, people who work with, with uh, these proteins have characterized them, and it's, it's pretty darn stable. Uh, but the question is, you know, let's say, I mean, you've got stomach acid, you've got temperature, you've got a variety of things. Uh, plus, um, it's got to make it to the brain. Can that happen? That's what people argue about, and that's not clear. Yeah. Stomach acid has, a, has, a, has an effect on proteins. Uh, primarily, if you leave proteins in stomach acid long enough, uh, the peptide bonds will get broken. So if you live it, left it there long enough, ultimately that would be a protection. But they, it may not stay in the stomach long enough for that to happen. If you want to completely hydrolyze a protein with uh, HCl, for example, you have to heat it up uh, for about 24 hours. So uh, 
probably wouldn't be exposed long enough in the stomach to, to have be a factor there. Okay, um, so misfolded proteins are important. Cell wants to be sure it doesn't have too much in the way of misfolded proteins. Amyloid fibers, there's a part of a, uh, a uh, plaque that's just, again, showing you schematically how these guys might align. Now, this provides me a very um, good place to talk about or think about some of these interactions that we've been talking about. So one of the interactions uh, that is important for us uh, to understand um, are hydrophobic interactions. I mentioned them briefly yesterday, and they may be very important in that folding process. You may remember I said with hydrophobic interactions, we're ha talking about amino acids whose side chains really don't like to be in water. So what do they do? They associate with each other. Well, that's fine and dandy once the protein is made, but what happens while the protein is being made? A protein is made one amino acid at a time. Can folding start, for example, before the protein is completely synthesized? The answer is yes, it can. Will that protein have any chemistry as it's being synthesized? And the answer is of course. It's composed of chemicals, so of course it will have chemistry. So let's imagine that I'm making this protein on my ribosome, and as proteins come out of a ribosome, they get squirted out one end. So I've got this polypeptide chain coming out. Ribosomes usually cluster so that protein synthesis of many proteins is occurring in the same place at the same time in the cell. Okay? Well, let's imagine that I'm making this protein, and I start the protein that's coming out, I get to this hydrophobic section, this long hydrophobic section starts coming out. I said hydrophobic amino acids want to associate with each other, right? But what if each other happens to be another polypeptide chain over here that has a similar uh, hydrophobic sequence? Will it want to associate with that one? The answer is yes, it will. Okay? Now, that could be a real problem because now instead of making a properly folded protein, we're going to have different subunits interacting that probably shouldn't be interacting in the first place kind of like the problem we have with the ribonuclease of the disulfide bonds between chains interacting with each other that gave rise to something that wasn't functional. If we have amino acid side chains that are hydrophobic and don't like water, they associate with each other instead of us folding in themselves, we need to have something to ensure that that phenomenon occurs as little as possible. We don't want to have a protein chains that come out that fold with different protein chains that they shouldn't on a random basis and cause problems. Well, our cells actually have a built-in protection for that. They have a structure called, a, a, a complex of proteins called chaperonins. I love that name. How many of you ever went on a date when you were like 13 or 14 years old? Mom and dad were the chaperone. Anybody have to do that? Did anybody ever have to, do they do that anymore? I don't know. Nobody had that happen? Okay. When I was that age, that was, a, that was a real problem, you know? You didn't want to have that. That chaperone was there, it kind of ruined the whole mood, it ruined everything, right? So, chaperonins do that with protein sequences. They actually isolate them. So, for certain proteins, this is not true for all proteins, but for certain proteins, they actually get synthesized into a little chamber, and this little chamber is part of these chaperonins. And the idea of the chamber is kind of the idea of the mom and dad as the chaperone. It's to kind of keep you from interacting with anything else that you shouldn't be interacting with. <laughs> okay? And allow, you to f allow that protein to fold properly on its own. It finds the sequences within itself and it's not going out and it's folding with something it shouldn't be folding with. The chaperonin does a really good job of that. The chaperonin can help proteins that have misfolded to fold properly. That's cool too. Okay. By providing a chamber where there's not interactions with other things that can cause problems, the chaperonins are very, very useful in this respect. Now, the last thing I'll tell you about chaperonins, and that'll be a good place for us to stop and take a break, um, is that chaperonins are synthesized when cells experience a phenomenon known as heat shock. Heat shock, okay? What's heat shock? Well, let's imagine you have a fever. 
your body temperature is going up a bit, that increase in temperature of a few degrees might have some effect on proteins in your body. Proteins are sensitive to heat. What happens if we denature the proteins in our body from a fever? Not a good career move, right? Well, it turns out that most cells have a set of genes called heat shock genes that when, they, when the cell senses it is getting shocked from temperature, and this works within a small range of temperature, but they're getting shocked from temperature, they will synthesize these heat shock proteins, some of which are chaperonins. And those chaperonins are there to help proteins to properly fold in spite of the heat. Let's say it works within a narrow range. If you decide to heat cells up to boiling temperature of water, you're not gonna, it's not going to work. But over the range of temperatures that an organism might experience while still being alive, a fever for example, those chaperonins can do a very good job of protecting the organism by helping its proteins to properly fold. So chaperonins are very good protections against misfolded proteins. Okay, any questions about that before we take a brief break? Okay, let's take a couple minute break and we'll come back. Yeah. Two hour lectures are hard, aren't they? Excuse me.